Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, it's uh, uh, pretty fascinating what we're accomplishing today. Uh, there are so many people who have been a critical part of the success. And since we're going to be talking about data and technology, how incredible that that is, our, uh, that is really our forum here and how we're interacting. So welcome, everyone. And thank you for taking the time to join us. And we will uh, move on to our first panel. And uh, let me just, as uh, Rich uh, said, we will try to uh, talk to each one of our panelists. I think that will keep the flow going really well. And le let me just introduce just the, the names of our panelists, Cy Vance, uh, uh, Jean Peters-Baker, Sherry Boston, and Nancy Parr. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Uh, so, Cy, let's uh, begin with you. Uh, um, I wanted to see in 2010, uh, your office was the first in the nation to develop an intelligence driven prosecution model uh, and which anchored the uh, crime strategies, uh, strategies unit. Uh, tell us uh, what drove that development for you, Sai, and your office. Good morning, Sam. And good morning, everybody. Thank you for including me uh, in this conference. And there's a lot of colleagues out there that I've come to know over the last 10 years on this call and uh, send my best to everyone and hope everyone has been doing well during the last six to seven months or as well as could be. Sim, uh, I ran for district attorney in 2009 after having been in private practice for about 20 years. And when I was running for district attorney, uh, Crime in New York City was at historic lows. And for New York City, that means instead of 2,300 homicides in a year, uh, there were you know, uh, four to 500 homicides in a year. There, so, but uh, essentially New York City had, through a variety of mechanisms over time, a reduced crime. And the question I asked myself uh, as I was running for DA is what does a DA's office do to drive crime even further? You know, you, you have this job, you can't just sort of sit, go take the job and then hope crime doesn't rise. What's the responsibility and then the opportunity for our office in Manhattan to find ways to drive crime even lower? Uh, and that required, in my view, our office to, uh, uh, to take an independent approach, separate from the police, but collaborating with the police, uh, to be able to more effectively identify who is driving crime in various neighborhoods, uh, how to gather information uh, throughout the office that's related to those individuals or, or gangs, and then to share that information and essentially oxygenate uh, the work of trial assistance in, in, in these gang investigations with intelligence that we've gathered. So um, the Crime Strategies Unit, as designed initially, Sim, uh, was essentially to be an intelligence unit within the DA's office, uh, where we were collecting intel from, from within the office, across our bureaus, from the police department and from the community. Uh, and to uh, using that information, uh, uh, use it to build cases against those folks who were driving crime. That was, that was the idea of it. And in order to affect that, um, uh, what we thought was the best way was, uh, we're a vertical office in Manhattan. So, uh, and that means we don't take cases geographically. We, we, we take cases from wherever they come in the county. But uh, we created a geographic uh, template uh, for the crime strategies unit so that the individuals in the unit themselves would have responsibility for five or six different zones in total uh, making up Manhattan. So what we got, we, what we got was uh, a, a focus on specific geographies uh, where the individuals in that crime strategies unit really were responsible for knowing, working with the police of the community, block by block, building by building, who's driving crime and making sure that whenever we identified one of those crime drivers coming through the system, whether it was for a pet at larceny or some more serious crime, uh, we, uh, we, had, we would create a, uh, essentially a notification system uh, so that if that individual who was a crime driver came into the system, we'd know it immediately and that case could be enhanced uh, uh, very early on. Uh, Sam, this was, uh, it was, was new for the office in a sense. Uh, it, it was creating an, a, a crime strategies unit that the office had never experienced before. And there was certain reluctance in the office. Uh, initially, I think hesitancy that who are these guys in the crime strategies unit asking about my cases and uh, trying to tell me information about the cases. And, and that took a couple of years uh, to sort out. Uh, but pretty much immediately, 
our focus was on identifying uh, youth gangs uh, and gun traffickers and focusing on violence and shooting in Manhattan. And at the time we came in, although crime was reduced, there still were a lot of shootings, uh, gang related uh, and, and otherwise in neighborhoods, neighborhoods in Manhattan. And, uh, and so we set about in the first year or so to identify, I'd say 20 to 25 different places in Manhattan where various violent activities were occurring, often, uh, often through youth crews or gangs. And we set about in each of those areas using intelligence that we were developing, shared through the Crime Strategies Unit uh, to build cases against uh, those, uh, those gangs. And over the course of five or six years, uh, uh, Sim, that's exactly what we did. And we've taken down you know, 23, 25 gangs over the course of, of the 10 years or so that we've been in office uh, with, I think, uh, you know, extraordinary public safety benefits as a result of those takedowns. The four, you'll, you'll, later on, Andy Warshower from our office will go through some of the, the visuals, but you know, in neighborhoods where there had been 10 to 15 shootings and five or six homicides over the course of the last three years, when those takedowns occurred, uh, those, you know, the, the crime in those neighborhoods post the takedown uh, was, ex was reduced enormously and for a period of time. Interestingly, when we introduced the Crime Strategies Unit, the police department thought it was bullshit. Uh, they thought this was, you know, this was, you know, DAs trying to do investigative work that belonged to the police. Uh, the counsel to Ray Kelly uh, you know, said it was, this was all just smoke and mirrors. Um, but we all in the off office had confidence, and, and David O'Keefe, who's on the phone, was was the first uh, was the first head of the Crime Strategies Unit. Uh, we, uh, you know, we set about do, saying, well, you know, we're, we're just going to do make this happen. And it took about a couple of years. But after we had three or four takedowns of 30 people in a gang or 40 people in a gang, and the police department started to say, well, wh what are these guys doing? Uh, because we were actually without the police uh, having a huge public safety impact. In any event, Ray Kelly finally came on board. The subsequent three police commissioners uh, also have embraced this. Uh, the city, in fact, mandated that every other district attorney's office in the city of New York, we have five, five counties, create a, create a crime strategies unit and, and the city funded it because it was a very, very effective way for our office to gather intel, make sure it didn't get lost uh, when a case was over, to spread it out to the assistants, to be in constant touch with the police department. Really 24-7, the, uh, the, 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 the individual who was head of a, a region or a grouping of precincts in Manhattan, they all developed extraordinarily close relationships with the police officers and commanders in those zones. And so I think it frankly just, it, it was, a, it was a, um, uh, you know, a, a real sea change and a very successful sea change in our, in our, in our attempt to fight violent crime. So that's, how, that's why we did it. That's how we did it. Uh, we got, as I said, a lot of resistance initially, both within the office and outside the office but over the, over the course of the last uh, 11 years, it's proven to be, I think, one of the most effective strategies and changes in the way we do business uh, in Manhattan. And you know, I, I, for the audience here, I know a, a number of, uh, of DAs around the country have instituted their own crime strategies units. And you know, Manhattan, we are a well-resourced office. It's a you know, very big city. It's a 600-person 600 600 uh, 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 lawyer office, and, and it's a very dense living environment. But the fundamentals of what a crime strategy is, gathering intel, then sharing it uh, across the office can be done, in my view, in a prosecutor's office of 20. It doesn't need to be 600. The same basic principles apply, which is you really are trying to know road by road, back road by back road, in our case, block by block, building by building, uh, what's causing crime. And that's enabling us to devote our resources intelligently and often independently to achieve the best public safety outcomes for, for our city. Great. So, I, you know, as you mentioned, you're a really large office. And uh, so maybe touch a little bit more on you, how your CSU uh, unit has impacted your ability to address specific crime trends and how it has allowed you to engage with your community uh, uh, as, a, as a product of the strategies that you've developed. Well, Andy Warshaw, when he talks in a moment, will show Manhattan divided up into five or six zones. Uh, we have a crime strategies analyst and a crime strategies assistant district attorney assigned to each one of those zones, maybe, maybe more. 
they are fundamentally dealing with the police, uh, the field intelligence officers and the commanders in the precincts. Uh, they are the point of light in our office for all kinds of police questions and concerns that come out of that, that come out of those precincts. But in addition, we have created a community partnerships unit, which is, which are non-lawyers, uh, essentially, you know, uh, uh, civilians who are, you know, who are performing sort of, who are, per who are in the communities, uh, explaining to the communities what we're doing, uh, gathering information from the communities, both from the business communities and from the, you know, and from the neighborhoods. So in addition to the crime strategies unit, we have over the same, you know, a, a layered geographically precisely the same, a community partnerships unit. So we're work, we, the partnerships unit is both proactive in sending information to the community and getting it back to the office. The crime strategies unit works in partnership with the community partnerships unit to make sure this, you know, this community intel also uh, also um, is passed along. So that's how we have worked with the community, and we have we have a, a very very robust outreach uh, to our various neighborhoods in Manhattan. And how critical has that partnership been? Because I think that's so important. We think about the uh, the technical side of the work that we do. Uh, I'm really intrigued by the idea of uh, just that citizens' participation. I assume that was as critical to the, uh, the in-court success and the intelligence success, having that opportunity to liaison with the, directly with the community, I was supposed I think, it, I think, I think uh, Sam, in, in, in truth, the intelligence that the crime strategies unit developed from within our office and across our 600 lawyers from speaking with the commanders in the precincts and, and NYPD broadly, those, you know, that really was, I think, driving the criminal justice safety success that we had in suing in Manhattan over the last 10 years. But the community partnerships unit, you know, coextensive with the crime strategies unit, uh, I would say that they were essential in having in making the communities feel they were a part of the strategy of making the communities in, in, in Manhattan safer. Uh, so, you know, they were creating essentially in each zone uh, business group. We would, we would convene the business groups and we would convene other groups of, of community residents or, or active people. And, uh, you know, and that, that, that really was more about being a presence in the community uh, supporting the community. We also have a very, very robust uh, uh, funding of uh, not-for-profits that are working in, in, in all over Manhattan, which perhaps we'll talk about some other time. And they're representing the face, the outreach face of the office that's there to help outside of court uh, to, and, and to, be, uh, to be that person who is interfacing with the citizenry of that, of that zone. Well, thank you, Sai. Uh, if we can move to uh, Jean Peters Baker, uh, another colleague of ours. Uh, uh, welcome, Jean. Uh, your office is uh, located in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, and in located in a large city uh, that has to address serious violent crime and a range of issues from multiple police departments to a geographically and demographically differ, uh, diverse citizenry. Tell us about creating your CSU and how it helps you address crime tense and engage with the police and the community. Good to see you. And it's also good to see uh, some of my other colleagues. I've missed you guys um, since we've all been um, bound uh, to Zoom, Zoom calls, yeah. but it's good to see you this way. Um, look, I, I think um, the idea of a crime strategies unit can be much broader than crime uh, strategies. And so that's one of the things that I've learned so the first thing I want to say for the number of DAs on this call is that um, you know you know you are a budget manager as well. You're the CEO. You you know you have to direct HR. You have so many responsibilities, and um, for offices that are maybe not grandly resourced, I think mine is probably better than some of my colleagues I know um, in resources. Uh, but that is a challenge, and it was very very hard for me. Um, to find the money and then to actually expend money on crime strategies. It just, you know, our world is focused on um, volume of cases and what does an individual prosecutor's caseload look like and, and kind of keeping that um, at a um, optimum level um, so that you can achieve, you know, good work. 
But this, I, I want to say this, it's been the best money that I've ever spent. It took me, um, you know, probably only about uh, 60 days in to realize that it is the best money I've spent on behalf of this office. Now, the second thing I will say that you're probably going to learn when you start this type of of effort in your office and you, our unit in your office is just how bad your data is. <laughs> um, so whatever your case management system is, and I'm sure it's probably a, a you know a decent case management system, it's highly unlikely you know that um, your office, like mine, gathered data in a way that was easy to report out. It was easy to make sense of later, and um, so that's a challenge. And so um, don't give up. Uh, if your data is is insufficient or your data, you, you have not collected data well over a, um, a period of years, you can make it up. Um, and so I, I would just encourage you to not, not throw in the towel because you've learned your data management system is so bad. The, and a couple other things that, that I've learned is um, this is helping me um, inform my decision makings. So just where I would count caseloads for prosecutors, this is actually a much smarter way to do it. So now um, I can actually modernize my office, move us more into you know, a new era. And um, now I know what amount of time are my prosecutors spending on particular cases? Do I want 30% uh, of the time of a prosecutor's office, my office to be spent on drug cases? The answer to that is no. <laughs> It's, it's an absolute no. I live in a jurisdiction where there's really high violence. Um, so we need to shift our resources to what, what, um, what our citizenry really wants and deserves. And that is a DA that is engaged in strategies to help lower violence levels um, and, and other types of crimes and how we can shift drugs perhaps to um, a format that is better suited to handle that particular societal problem than traditional prosecution. So, so as you envisioned it, how, what was the evolution of it like? How has it evolved from when you started to actually implementation and execution? I thought when I started it that we would be very much in the, the crime strategies you know, arena, that we would be uh, determining um, pockets of the city that were um, really plagued by certain types of crime versus others, that we would develop strategies, um, you know, singularly through the, the crime strategies unit, we would go after crime in that sense. It is so much broader than that now. I mean, in the, in the handful of months that we've been um, really at this in earnest. And so um, it is really helping me restructure my office. Um, you know, I'm critical sometimes of my largest police department about how they have not modernized um, themselves in an era where um, the war on drugs has ended. <laughs> and, but some, some police departments are still fighting <laughs> or structurally, uh, they are still um, in that model to go after drug cases when, when violence, you know, is just such a prevailing issue. And this is helping me understand what my own role is in that and how I can pull uh, myself out of it. So I am literally now discovering, um, you know, the, the type of granular detail that I, I am gaining is what are racial disparities look like in particular types of drug cases, in, a, in an interdiction case, in a by bust operation, and um, where are those car stops occurring? And, this is critical uh, to understanding what you do. And once you have that knowledge, uh, you can't unknow it. And when you know it, uh, you are better able to solve a problem. And that's, that's where I'm taking my office now is that we are shifting um, pretty greatly. It is gonna cause um, a lot more friction, I think with my police department who are, you know, my largest police department who is not in that space and they don't want to, I don't believe they want to go into that space. So we're gonna take them there anyway, um, because it is the right thing to do. And like I said, I, I know a lot more now than I did a year ago when I formed this unit. Okay. So, um, you know, you're talking about this application and uh, not only as a tool to give you information, but also to help you uh, establish strategies to response. Now, recently uh, violent crime has gone up in Kansas City 
uh, uh, how are you using this unit and does this crime strategy unit help you address that uh, issue in a strategic way for as, as you envisioned it? Maybe touch yeah. upon that a little bit. Um, yes, <clears throat> so we are using it. Uh, we gained a partnership with a, a police department that wanted to be all in with us. So I think that's first. Um, it is really helpful to have a police department that you don't have to drag along with you and or cajole along with you, but take with you um, willingly. You can do so much more um, when you share a vision and a, um, a direction um, for your city. And so I am working with um, a police department on this very effort where we are, we have targeted violence, um, violent crime in that jurisdiction is, is what we want to address. And <clears throat> We have undertaken these types of efforts before and they have been successful in reducing overall violence, not just reducing violence, but also uh, dramatically raising the clearance rates on cases like homicide, which is, is really critical in gaining uh, trust with your community is that you're actually effective, uh, that you're good at what you do, and that you can respond with the justice system um, for their benefit. So, um, this jurisdiction that I have, um, you know, engaged in a partnership with, we're at the very beginning uh, stages of it, but we have also engaged social services at a much greater level than I did the last time I undertook this kind of effort, where social services is really going to lead the effort and enforcement will, um, will be behind um, there and necessary because arrest and prosecution is still, a, you know, a viable model, but it shouldn't always be the... Um, the first thing that we pick. Um, we want first and foremost our, our um, jurisdiction to be safe and everyone to be safe. Um, I'm just not convinced that um, arrest and prosecution is always the path to make it safer. And so forming new partnerships through this type of, type of crime strategies with community and community partner agencies has been really, really critical. You know, you mentioned something, I just want to explore just a little bit quickly. Uh, you know, you, you talked about how uh, you've gathered this information and it's helped you dis make decisions for you and informed you. Have you found this tool to be also effective because you started with the idea of resource and how limited our resources are and also having that outreach with your board of governors or your uh, enabling authority that gives you your funding to also use it as a tool in terms of that conversation uh, for resources. Well, my jurisdiction is just a little bit different in the sense that we have a quarter cent sales tax that has been collected for a number of years now that is for um, crime prevention, drug treatment, um, and those types of, of, of issues. It funds a little bit of law enforcement and a little bit of prosecution, a little bit of the courts, but it, it primarily, um, its focus is on drug treatment. And so I have a variety of, um, and I get, I get to oversee this tax as well as part of my job as okay. prosecutor. In my um, overseeing the tax, this type of information, when you gather you know, this type of crime strategies information, uh, basic demographic information, I can better inform my community service agencies um, about what would be most helpful. For instance, um, my crime strategies unit has been able to determine some basics, um, who is it that's getting shot the most? Um, where are their bodies? Are they getting shot most often? How close to home are they getting shot? Um, wh what treatment providers are most likely engaged you know, in the medical um, side of providing treatment to them and their families? And, that, um, and there is a lot of other demographic information we've been able to pull. That's information that I can share with those um, nonprofits that, um, helps them better, better understand um, their work. And, you know, I think for too long, prosecutors have left all the data um, of that's out there. You know, we just sort of left it in the abyss or we left it with the police department to, to try and explain out. And for us, um, it is not just drawing data, but it's also trying to put a context um, to that as well. And this additional role that I have overseeing this um, sales tax has been really, um, helpful to kind of pair those two things together so that we all can be on the same mission and, and drive in the same direction, which is reducing violence and, and treating drugs the most effective way we know how. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jean. If we can now sort of move to Sherry Boston. 
Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Boston. Uh, uh, and uh, your jurisdiction uh, includes a portion of Atlanta. And Jean, uh, like Jean's, uh, you deal with multiple police departments uh, and diverse geography and demographics. Uh, uh, what is the model of Crime Strategies Unit in your office, uh, Sherry? That is going to be what the saying of 2020, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Miss Boston. And uh, uh, I don't know if you heard my question. Do, 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 wonderful. I, Welcome. Thank you. you not hear me, but um, <laughs> thank you so much for having me here. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to share this platform with, with people that I uh, respect and have learned from a great deal. Um, and so uh, when it comes to Crime Strategies Unit, um, when I took office in December of 2017 as district attorney, I knew that I wanted to develop um, a crime strategies unit and expand community outreach. Um, I'd had the opportunity to serve as solicitor general for the six prior years, which in the state of Georgia is the other elected prosecutor that handles um, misdemeanors. And our office is a felony only office. Um, and when I was there under that six year tenure, I'd started a community prosecution unit, but I knew when I became DA um, that I wanted to elevate the work. I wanted to do it in a smarter way. Um, as everyone said, it's, you know, you have limited resources, um, but more importantly, we wanted to take a data driven approach. Um, so my team and I started researching how other offices across the country were using these types of strategies. And of course, we found ourselves at the doorstep, front door of um, my good friend, Cy Vance, who um, not only uh, opened the door for us, but uh, let us into his living room, so to speak. Um, and that was one of the first places I visited. And when we left uh, Cy's office, I knew that I said, uh, you know, our office is much smaller than Manhattan, but there's so many things that you've done, and we really want to adapt uh, what you've done here uh, in DeKalb. And he, of course, was so gracious and said, I'll give you everything we've done, everything we've learned, um, so that you can press forth in, in your community. Um, after that, we had the opportunity to go out to um, San Francisco to a crime strategies conference. And that's where we saw different offices um, in San Fran, St. Louis and others that were presenting. Again, it was great to see, you know, every office is different. And that's what I love about this particular panel is you're showing different size offices with different issues. And so we were able to see how various offices had adapted um, the intelligence driven prosecution model and created these crime strategies units. And so I was committed to doing that. Um, and to Jean's point, you know, the first premise was how do I start this? How do I do this when there's not money allocated or set aside for it? Um, and that's where the buy in and the partnerships became really important. Um, one of the first things we did before we even started the unit. Um, was myself and my leadership team reached out to our police agency, um, our main police agency, because we do have um, 13 law enforcement agencies um, just in our county uh, municipal and local police departments. And that doesn't even include um, our universities, our transit and our, our federal and state partners. Um, so we have a lot of different law enforcement agencies um, which is slightly different than how we saw it in New York, where there was just one, you know, main central police department across the city of New York, despite it being, you know, chopped up into the different districts. Um, so we decided to start with a partnership with our main agency. And so that is the DeKalb Police Department. They are the primary law enforcement agency for most of unincorporated DeKalb. Um, and they serve approximately 750,000 of our population over 271 square miles. And so we started there and I reached out to the chief and I said, this is something I'm really interested in doing. And um, it really wasn't a fight for us because our police department was already engaged uh, in intelligence driven policing. Um, so they were intimately familiar with the background model of how to engage the community and how to use data to get results. So 
you know, to them, they saw this as an extension of the work. Um, and unlike how Sai described how he had to, you know, convince the police department that he wasn't going to be kind of stepping into the lane and stepping uh-huh. on the toes, our police department very much saw it as, oh, this could be an extension of what we've already been doing. Um, and so when we went to those first meetings, that first uh, crime strategies conference out in San Francisco, I invited um, a few members of the command staff from the police department mm-hmm. to travel um, with my team as a delegation. So we all got to be in the room together, hear what other prosecution offices were doing. Um, and there were other law enforcement there as well. So we started our buy-in by saying, let's all go and work together. I want you to help me build what this is going to look like. Um, and as a result of that, as we put this together piece by piece, because it wasn't something where, I mean, now we have um, a deputy chief, um, three ADAs, a data analyst, a part-time investigator and a full-time investigator. That's what we have right now as we sit here today. But when we started, we didn't have all of that. Um, And we had to piecemeal it slowly together. And a part of those initial conversations were one of the first asks that I made of the police department was for them to loan me uh, my very first investigator. I I wanted them to give me a homicide detective that worked for DKPD, that was on their payroll that would come live with us. And we thought that that was a great transition because, you know, unlike the investigators that directly work for the district attorney's office, they have a little bit of a different role and a different focus um, than the investigators that work at the police department. We wanted a hybrid to start that. We wanted someone that Um, was going to be in those roll calls every day and getting direct case information as it happened, but also someone that understood the work that we were doing as we prepared cases for prosecution. So that's how we got our first investigator. And that partnership was and remains critical to keep open those lines of communication. So when we opened our unit, we named it the Crime Strategies and Community Partnerships Unit. Oh. And as you heard <laughs> I described, and, and again, I, you know, I am so grateful and I will give credit where credit is due to Sai because we took pieces of what we saw in his office and adapted it to what would work for us. So as you heard Sai describe, his Community Partnerships Unit is a separate unit that overlays that's Um, civilians. Um, Ours is not. So everybody that works in our crime strategies unit is also a part of the community partnerships unit. So part of their role is the intelligence driven prosecution model and data collection um, and supporting our trial line, our major case, um, and all the units in our office that they can push that information out to but they also are responsible for being embedded uh, in the community. Um, And so they share all of those responsibilities. Um, And that's why I say to folks on this call, if you're thinking about doing this in your office, think about how you can do it. If I had all the money in the world, of course I would create multiple units to (laughs) do all of these things. But I didn't, so I had to be creative on what will work for us. And actually, this was a model that worked very well for us. So our, um, just to tell you about how, a little bit how we do it, we divide our county into four geographic zones based on, and we based our zones on our um, DKPD, our DeKalb County Police Department precincts. Um, but also those lawyers have adopted the additional partner agencies that exist in those zones. So we didn't leave out our other police and law enforcement agencies, our smaller agencies. We've just incorporated into those zones. But our primary focus is, is the zones that were created by the department. Um, and we have um, an ADA from our office is assigned to each zone. And all those attorneys keep precinct hours two to three days a week, meaning they spend 
some of their time outside of our main office in downtown Decatur and spend office hours. Um, they have offices in each of those those precincts, which again, having those relationships with the police department that allowed us to have that office space embedded um, allowed us to get a better idea of what was happening in each of those specific areas. Um, this allows those relationships with the individual chiefs, the commissioners that serve those districts, and um, the geographic areas, and they can then become experts in those communities and understand the needs of that geographic zone of our county. Um, and of course, now during the pandemic, we've had to shift um, and we're not, the precincts are closed um, to non-uniform personnel. So our ADAs are still keeping those hours, but they're doing their, their precinct hours via Zoom. So, you know, I think you really clearly defined how critical those external partnerships with those outside agencies were and having their buy-in there. I'm curious, what does intelligence-driven prosecution mean to your line prosecutors? And were there any challenges? Because in essence, they're looking at their normal caseload and you're saying, hey, there's this other way that I want us to sort of look at it. And the first reaction may be, hey, you're overlapping work on it. And is this really the right thing for us to do from a practical challenge? So if you can share maybe a little bit what that conversation and that what that philosophical or conceptual shift was that you needed to do with your own staff in uh, adopting and implementing this, uh, this policy that you were advocating. Absolutely. So that was all about the buy-in. It was necessary to create um, a cultural shift on how we pro process intelligence data in our cases. Um, and the office had, had previously had experience with community prosecution. So we had to explain to them how different this was. Um, but I think the shift really comes when people start to get something back, perhaps that they didn't have yeah. before. Um, and I think two things helped with that. First, um, the unit began giving the trial line lawyers valuable information um, that helped assist them in the cases. For example, our CSCPU unit provides intelligence regarding an offender's arrest within 24 to 48 hours. And they help create those early bond packets and probation packets um, before a first appearance. Um, at the same time that we were doing this, we also started a, a uh, pre-charging unit that we never had in our office. So it, it was almost like there were a lot of new shifts, but our trial division understood that when they were getting their cases and seeing um, that the CSCPU attorneys were monitoring certain folks and that they knew that they could rely on them or call them up and say, I see this is flagged as yours. What information can you give me? What can you tell me as I'm preparing for this particular bond hearing or probation revocation hearing at the earliest stages? Um, and so that has been, I think, getting that valuable information has allowed um, folks to understand the importance. Um, and then of course, we just, our data analyst, finally, we just got her on board in, in 2020. Actually, we onboarded her during COVID. Um, and that has been tremendous because that was like the final ring that I was finally able to get funding for earlier this year. And so we are already seeing how our data analyst is fitting so very clearly within this unit um, helping to assist major case on gun-related and gang-related crimes. And now we're working on a project, a group violence intervention project um, through um, with John Jay and our police department um, that has really pulled all of this together. Um, and ultimately our goal is to address violent crime, um, gang-related, gun-related, and homicides in our county um, and we are hopeful that all of these collaborations um, will help push that number down. Um, and we can see the same type of success that Sai has seen when he was able to reduce um, his homicide count in Manhattan. 
I'm just going to ask one more quick, quick question. There is a question that was posed by one of our co uh, colleagues uh, uh, that uh, were there any data deficits that you, that surprised you as you went through this process? Uh, and uh, how did you uh, uh, fill some of those data deficits? Lots of data deficits. Um, you know, I, when I, we since I have been district attorney, we have transitioned to a new case management system. Um, data was not really being collected in the prosecution office in the same way that police departments were collecting data. So we really didn't start doing it until I got into office. And even as our data analysts has come on board, it's been interesting to be in meetings with her um, because we're still trying to isolate the data that we are collecting if it's the right data and if it can produce meaningful results. So I would say to anyone out there, if you are asking yourself, you know, does a prosecution office really need a data analyst? I'd say absolutely, because there's so much metrics that I, we can get from a data analyst that will help drive perhaps the questions, the right questions for us to ask um, and to gather the information that our community really wants to know and to be a measure of success. And for prosecutors who have spent decades um, touting conviction rates, right? They keep data on that. Um, yeah. That is probably the least informative yeah. amount of metric that you can have in a prosecution office. Like we have to change our mindset because at the end of the day, I say, if I tomorrow can end crime in my county and effectively be out of a job, fire me because there's nothing for me to do, I will have been 100% successful in doing what my community hired me to do. Right. And then hope that someone else would hire me to do something. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Boston. Uh, let's move on to our next panelist, uh, Ms. Nancy Parr. Uh, welcome, Nancy. Uh, you, you're the uh, uh, Commonwealth Attorney in Chesapeake, Virginia. Your office is smaller than some of the other officers, offices here on this panel but you still need to focus on violent crime, uh, dr violent crime drivers and community concerns. And uh, you do not have a, 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 a crime strategies unit. How do you get data and information about crime trends and crime drivers? Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna talk fast because I know we're running out of time. Um, so I am a small office. I have 26 attorneys. I have a population of 250,000. Um, but I also have 350 square miles, so um, we're, we're spread out. Um, when I was elected in 2005, and so I'm going to go back to something that Jean said, I absolutely agree with her when she says that the strategy model can be very broad, um, and you should look at that. That's, that's just how I, when I came in in office in 2005. I um, gather a lot of my information, um, and it's, it's not data, but it's information, and I gather it from my citizens. And I do that through community outreach and engagement. And I started that uh, when I first came in office in 2005, which was a different, different track um, and path than my predecessors had taken. Um, but I was bound to determine that my citizens were going to know who I was, who my attorneys were, um, by not having to come to court to meet us, that they were going to know us otherwise. Um, and so I just started with the civic leagues, community um, groups, churches, schools, um, and talking to people, just the old fashioned talking to people. And it has really grown through the years. I know uh, Chris Hammond has heard me speak repeatedly about um, some of my programs, but I'm very proud of, of a couple of my programs that have um, really, I believe, reached my, my youth in the city, which um, I want to prevent them from coming into my system. Um, that is, that's a huge goal of mine. And uh, just three of those, it's my Girls Empowerment Conference. It's a, we do it on Saturdays. It is absolutely free for everybody. We provide breakfast and lunch. And I will tell you the way that came about was that the U.S. Attorney's Office um, had some leftover PSN money and they wanted to know, did I have a use for it? Um, I was like, well, it might not be much for them, but it's a whole lot to me. And so I took it and I ran with it. And then also it came out of just a conversation with my provost from my community college at a luncheon that I wanted to do this girl's empowerment, but I, I was looking for a place and she just volunteered 
the campus. She volunteered her faculty. She volunteered everything. Um, and that's how it got it started. Um, and then that led to a boys leadership conference, the same thing. And then a basketball tournament, which we call playing on the right team. Um, it's uh, police officers, firefighters, sheriff's deputies, and the youth participating in round robin uh, basketball tournaments where everything is free, food and everything. But because of those, I get to talk to the people and they tell me what their issues are in the neighborhoods. They tell me what their concerns are and they tell me, they also tell me what they want me to do. <laughs> yeah, they're very, they're very free with uh, telling me what it is they think I should do. Um, so that's, and then, um, so I get my data though, my, my, you know, my stats right now, I get it from my police department and also using national data. Um, when we started a lethality assessment protocol with the police department, we based that on national data. Um, and so um, we're using that. One of the problems I have find, found when people ask me for stats for my office is how do they def definitions, like somebody's <laughs> definition of, of something. Like I had a citizen ask me, how many firearm charges did I have in, you know, a calendar year? And then the next, and what percentages of the, what percentage was conviction? And I was like, well, I can give you that, but that's not really a fair picture or an accurate picture of what happened because somebody could have been charged with 10 firearm charges, but they pled to two. It doesn't mean we lost eight cases. You know, it's, yeah. so that's a, that's an issue for me when I'm looking at data. Um, I will also put in a plug for NDAA uh, because on October 28th, there will be a free uh, virtual um, one hour uh, seminar, prosecution by the numbers, working with state policymakers and leveraging data to improve decision making. And that is a free one hour that they're gonna be looking at what Connecticut um, has just completed. And um, so that's, that's how we're doing data right now. And when I listen to, um, when I, when I listen to my other colleagues on the panel, I, and I look at uh, the elements of a crime strategies unit, I was like, well, we do that. We just don't call it that. And probably in smaller offices, it might tend to be the elected who just kind of takes it on um, because we, we don't have the, <laughs> the uh, money or the people um, like Sherry's crime strategies unit. That's that's bigger than many offices across the country. Just that one unit is bigger than a lot of offices across the country. Um, um, but I do think that um, a lot of people are doing this. We just don't call it that. Um, so I know you have another question. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. So, so you're talking about the, uh, the idea of collaboration. So as a prosecutor, what are those, uh, uh, because I think you do capture some of the realities of some of the smaller offices. What have you found to be key collaborations that are, are, are really important to you in your role as a prosecutor? Uh, well, I, um, I find that um, using multi-jurisdictional uh, multi task forces with our surrounding um, cities or counties um, has been very helpful because it brings in more resources, it brings in more people, and other offices that might be a little bit larger or have specific personnel can collect the data or they can analyze it where the smaller office can't. And then also collaboration with our U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, I know sometimes some of our cities in our area, they've had a real problem, they've had a real gang problem or a gun problem, and um, you know, going to the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and saying, hey, look, we need help. You know, don't be proud. <laughs> Ask if you need help. Um, and so that that has been very helpful. Um, I will also say just collaboration with the sheriff and your in, um, law enforcement and your local government, which has also been said on here. When I when I started in 2005, I mean, I have one office, um, had one office. It's in the courthouse, which is where I am now. But Back then, I um, talked to my police chief, talked to my sheriff, talked to my city council members and said, hey, look, I want a satellite office. Um, I want a satellite office and I don't want to just randomly pick where I go. I want, I want some data. I don't have the data. Somebody give me some data. And what we, what we used was the number of calls for service. So we didn't use it on arrest rates or conviction rates. We used um, the police department's data on the number of calls for services in an area. 
And so the city uh, gave me an uh, office, a uh, small, but it serves my purpose. It's actually in the health department right now. That's where it's been. Um, I didn't realize the benefits of that until witnesses said, I'd much rather go to the health department to meet with a prosecutor than to come into the courthouse because somebody might see me coming in the courthouse into your office. I can go to the health department and come into your office and they just think I'm going to the health department. Um, and also transportation, we don't have pub, we don't have mass transportation down here, so it's easier for a lot of people to get to my satellite office than it is to get to my office. Um, also, um, I think the collaboration with um, the um, our courts, like looking at their data, because they keep data separate from from us, um, and this was not. Um, really part of this group, but it was something that um, some one of the other panelists said, um, you know, about how do you get people on board with this? You know, I have 26 lawyers, so how I got them on board was I told them that they were going to do it. I mean, that's <laughs> going to do it. Um, but I also know my personalities because I got 26. I know them all very well. I talk to every single one of them every day. I know their personalities. And there are some people that absolutely should never be part of my drug court. That's just not their personality. <laughs> you know, should they do something else? Yes. You know, um, so I think that's an advantage of a small office is that you do know where people fit better and what, what they can, um, what they would be better at. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just ask a general question. If I and I may, if I may ask each one of you to maybe take about a minute, minute and a, a, a two minutes to just uh, help saw, finish this and bring it home. In what ways is the modern prosecutor expected to be a problem solver? Sai, can we start with you? Maybe a, a, a sort of a, a, an idea about that, and I'd like to just sort of go back in the same order and let you sort of uh, finish that up in that way. So in what ways is the modern prosecutor expected to be a problem solver? And is that a legitimate expectation? I do think that over the last decade, um, it's been my experience that prosecutors are approaching crime fighting uh, in ways that are non-traditional uh, and would not have been done by prosecutors' offices in the past. I, so yes, Sim, I think we, you know, we are aggressively using diversion programs uh, to, uh, to, in Manhattan, for example, we have consciously reduced the number of misdemeanors we brought into the system from about 80,000 in 2010 to about 35,000 last year. So that's, and, and the, that the Delta is cases that were diverted or in some that were not brought through the ordinary court process. That also happens to address, I think, the, the serious issues, at least the urban prosecutors have, with regard to race in our justice system. Um, so, so we are, you know, we are in the sense that uh, so many of the folks that are coming into the system are men and women of color. So if we can, if we can find better paths for that 50,000 people a year uh, through non-traditional diversion practices that actually may have better outcomes from criminal justice than, than arrest and, and prosecution. Uh, that's, I think that's, that's crime fighting in a productive and problem solving way. Uh, and so, yes, I think we are expected to think about our job more broadly, but of course, prosecutors, uh, you know, are, this is, this is a role that is, I think, important for prosecutors to embrace, my opinion. But honestly, the, you know, the bigger problems that uh, are need to be addressed in, uh, in terms of uh, the societal issues of inequality in education and employment and opportunity, these are things that prosecutors can't deal with. All we can really deal with is, is sort of the criminal justice levers that we hold in our hands. Wonderful. Thank you. Jean? To build on what Sai said, and that is prosecutors do hold the keys. Maybe it's a little bit late um, when something gets to our doorstep, because obviously there's been a variety of police actions already. 
um, as, it re as it relates to minority communities. Things have already happened by the time that case file has gotten to our door. However, prosecutors have a huge role that we can play in knowing what our data um, shows us. We need to be informed about racial disparities in cases that come to our door. And when you know that, you are absolutely under an obligation to fix that. Just because the police maybe um, have not engaged in that kind of analysis is not a good enough answer. Yes. And perhaps if your police agencies are not a full um, embracing partner, like perhaps um, Sherry's appear uh, to be, um, that's not any, that, that can't be your answer either. You can't just throw up your arms as the prosecutor. This is a place that we can go and we really can make a difference here um, by looking at, at equity in our offices, but also in the cases that hit our door and what we're going to do with them. Wonderful, thank you, Jane. Thank you for bringing that point. Uh, uh, Ms. Boston? I, I'll just say quickly, I echo what I heard from, from Jean and from Sai. We have to reimagine the role of a prosecutor. Um, and this new role, uh, if we wanna say 2020, because I'm sure many of us are probably gonna wanna forget 2020 once it's mm -hmm. behind us, but the idea is, is that we, we have to, in order to move our communities forward, we need to imagine that our role is bigger than just waiting for something to come to our door. We have a, a keen and, and necessary responsibility to do things differently. I think the communities that are effectuating change are ones where you have a district attorney that's willing to understand that it's bigger than just case in and case out and, and, and really making the donuts. It's about um, restoring, uh, engaging and protecting, which is what our tagline is for us, our community. Uh, and we can only do that if we think of ourselves as problem identifiers, problem solvers, and um, problem correctors. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, and Ms. Parr? Uh, so <clears throat> I agree I agree with what my um, the other panelists said. And also with the diversion programs, I, I think the diversion programs are, are really very good. I think that there are large segments of this country that do not have access to diversion programs. Um, I think that that is something that um, the localities um, really should be focused on. My, my thing is that I always want to be invited to the table. Um, I may not, I can't, I can't build the shelter, but I want to be at the table when my, when my city is having a conversation. And so when the city manager, the city manager invites me to come to a conversation to talk about some change in this city or to some collaboration with our surrounding cities, I go. I go to those meetings. I want to be at the table. I want to have my input about what my office can do and how I think it would make our citizens safer and just make it a better community. So my thing is just get to the table. Wonderful. Well, first of all, I just want to take a second to thank all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your experience and sharing that insight with us. And I think you've given us a lot to think about for the full range of uh, different offices that we represent. And I think the one point I would say is data is not your enemy. It's actually a tool that is available to you. And we as uh, prosecutors are community leaders. We have an affirmative obligation to not only identify problems as Ms. Boston said, but how do we come to curing them? And part of that is an intelligence driven, data driven information sharing. One of the core challenges for us has always been transparency. What is it that we do? Why are we making the decisions that we're doing it in an open way to establish that communication with our community and good uh, data allows us to be effective as a community leader. So thank you, every one of you for participating this morning and uh, thank you, Ms. Haman. And I will turn this time over now to our uh, uh, macro or meta moderators and uh, to move on to our next session in our uh, conference today. <laughs>